Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right, I'm Malik. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> so what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. So, you know, a lot of thought went into, you know, you know, working the steps, working the program. Just by the way, um... <clears throat> My sobriety date is the 17th of May of 2009. If you look at the paper, you just see the numbers was transposed. But, um, you know, I got sober in 09, and um, I just had my anniversary. So right now, as we speak, I got 14 years. So, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, one of the things you do, like, every time you get an anniversary, you act like what a child would do at that age, right? So, you know, now I'm like, you know, falling in love and I get to express how I feel about love and, um, you know, get a girlfriend like I'm into a girlfriend, you know, but that was the biggest thing for me. Like when I say that, I'm like, oh, I can get emotional now. But um, just thinking back, um, like, all right, so I, I'm an alcoholic, right? And tell you the truth. The, when doing the work with a sponsor, the furthest, like the first time I could ever remember drinking alcohol and see, this is how I know, like my, my problem, you know, we say it centers in the head, but my problem centers in the head because my first drink, I'm going to just explain this to y'all, right? So I have an older cousin. She's about six to eight years older than me, right? So one night she has all her girlfriends over and they're sleeping over, right? So, you know, for me, the little boy, I'm like, whoa, like, you know what I'm saying? They all in the house. I'm sneaking around, spying on them, you know what I'm saying? Just trying to, just trying to be there, you know what I'm saying? One of them I love, like, my whole, like, of my childhood I was in love with, you know, I'm not growing because, you know, we being recorded. But one of them in that house, you know what I'm saying? Like, for my whole childhood, I love this girl, right? And so, of course, you know, they teenagers, and, um, you know, they, they started drinking, then they gave me some, right? You know, just to give me some. And um, I don't know if I was just, you know, so happy and gully because they was there, or it was the alcohol, but it was like, after that, you know, that 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 was the feeling that I always remembered, and um, I will always try to get to again because... Um, you know, I tell people, like, we had, you know, I was just doing crazy stuff, like, you know, I'm just trying to get attention. So I'm doing flips, I'm flipping off of everything, you know, I'm trying to make them laugh, you know, and I'm just being a fool. And um, and I remember that. I can remember that to this day, like, jumping over garbage cans and everything, like, you know, lining up stuff to run and jump over it. And then they just, you know, hey, yeah, like, and then they, ooh, I get hyper, right? Woo! And that was like, you know, the first time I drink. And then like after that, like drinks would come like once a year, like New Year's. That was like the only time, you know what I'm saying? Even, you know, I'm a child, but, you know, they'll let you get a little taste on New Year's. And then I would act the same fool. Like I equated acting a fool with drinking. Like if I get to drink a little bit, it's going to be cool for me to act a fool, right? Like that. that's how, that's how I believe... I turned into mild liquor, you know, later on. But I say, you know, I, I had equated drinking with just wilding out, acting crazy. So, of course, you know, like anybody else, grew, grew up in a good, you know, a good household. You know, um, I, I mean, for real, when you think about it, as long as I've been sober and, you know, you start to make a gratitude list. You know, when I was younger, I had a lot to complain about. But now these days, you know what I'm saying, I'm, I'm grateful for, you know, the way I grew up because I know a lot of people that had harder stories and um, I just grew up and, um, you know, just regular. But as I got older, you know, I would always get in trouble, though. I, I You know, I could say that, though. I, I would always get in trouble or get a beating. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll be the class clown. You know what I mean? Like, I guess because I was the only child. You know what I mean? So, like, when I'm not around my mother, you know, I'm somebody else. 
not around my grandmother. I'm somebody else. So, um, yeah, in school, I, you know, I always was getting notes sent home and getting a beat. And then, you know, I, you know, just got immune to beatings. I was just talking to my mother the other day. I was like, you remember the last time you beat me? Like, you know, I was like, like, <laughs> like she couldn't do it. No more. Like she just ran out of strength. I'm just standing there like this. She just beat me. And I'm just standing there like, you know, wait until it's over. You know, they're like, just wait until it's over. And then that was the last time she beat me. And then she actually said it. Because she was like, it doesn't do anything no more. So, you know, I remember that. But um, my journey with alcohol, like, for me, for real, it, um, I want to say it really started with weed. Because, you know, we would drink... We would drink, like back then we was drinking 40s, and but you know what I'm saying, like my mom was on weed. So it was a real um, situation on how I got into the weed spot. Um, so I don't know, in New York where I grew up at, so it's like a, a weed spot. So, you know, like the dread is in the weed spot. You go and put your money in a hole, they get your money through, you know, you know. So... The dread in the weed spot had asked a friend of mine, because, you know, we had sent him to go get the weed, like, to come in and paint for him, right? And he was like, get one of your buddies to come paint with you. And then, you know, we went in there. We were supposed to be painting this side because, you know, he had the whole thing. We were supposed to be painting inside the weed house, right? But then the dread, lo and behold, had a crush on my aunt. Had a crush on my aunt. And then when he found out who my aunt was... You know what I'm saying? It was like, I, I was like the golden kid because he was like, yo, blah, blah, blah. Like, he would try to get me to hook him up with my aunt. And now my aunt, like, she can't know I'm in here. So, you know, I'm like, I'm like, no, nah, like, you know. But, you know, fast forward, worse come to worse, you know, I'm, I'm working there first. It started off as painting. It started off as painting. And, um, you know, one day I'm, I'm working the door. Um I don't know. He, cause he, you know, I, you know, as he just probably thought I was smart or something. And then the guy, see, this is the thing that I talk about because the guy that got me in there, you know what I'm saying? So the, the dread used to do cocaine. And this is when we were real young. Of course, crack is an epidemic. So we got crackheads in the family. We see what crack doing. The crack head family members taking your stuff and selling it, you know, so we know not no rocks. Like, you know, we children, like no rock, like we hate that, right? But um see, he didn't grow up like that. So he had a different house and he lived on the same block as me, but you know, when the when the dread offered us some cocaine, he took it. And um I, I really want to say, you know, I'm not here to tell his story, but he ain't never been the same since. He ain't that, and that's like all of us, right? You know, we don't be the same since. So the dread tried to get me to do that too, but I didn't. But lo and behold, I'm working in the weed spot. I'm going to high school. As a matter of fact, I remember because um, the dread used to give us, you know, bad, like when he paid us, he used to give us weed too. And I used to just save my weed just to go to school and, you know, show off at school. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I was going to a new school. And um, we was in high school, and I remember one time, you know, hanging out with the older kids, and they, like, they trying to do this and trying to do that. Then I go in my book bag and pull it out. They like, yo, what the thing? You know, everybody going crazy. And I'm like, this is, you know what I'm saying? This is what I do. And, you know, they kind of knew because, you know, back then it was all about Nordica and Jordans and, you know what I'm saying, stuff like that. But um, so all through high school, that's what it was really about. And then, you know, with the girlfriend. And, um, I, you know, there's always a girl involved, right? There's always a girl involved. So for me, you know what I'm saying? I was smoking it with, like, you know, weed was my thing. Weed was my thing. And um, I had this one girlfriend. She lived around the corner. And, um, you know, we she would come hang out or whatever. And then when it was time for me to walk her home, I would always stop at the liquor store and get a Montebello Long Island iced tea. And... I did not remember this until after I had spoke with her years later, and she reminded me of that, because that's where I really started drinking. Like, I started drinking like that by myself, because she wouldn't smoke or drink. As much as I tried to get her to smoke and drink, she wouldn't do none of it, you know what I'm saying? So, so that's how I started. And then, of course, you know, 
I guess I'm just hanging out. You know, everybody know I got weed. So, you know, you got a hundred friends, everybody your friend now. So, you know, just hanging out in the park, you know, and, um, so now I'm drinking with everybody. Like the same guys we used to play basketball with, like, you know, all of us just, you know, we, when we were younger, we was doing constructive things, but you know, once we got, you know, in high school, let's just say in high school, once we got into high school, everybody, you know, that was just something else. So we all doing something else. And um, that's when the drinking was fun. Just, you know, hanging out, drinking, you know, um, just fast forward on that. Um, one day, one day I had another girlfriend, right? And, um, but you know, I had just really met Shorty and I was, we went to the movies, right? And I didn't go to work that day. And um, one of the guys that I hang out with, went to go rob the weed spot because they thinking I'm in there, right? Let me tell you how God worked, God doing for me before I could do for myself back then. So um, I didn't go to work that day, you know, and um, they shot the dread in the leg. They, you know, put the pistol through the hole and shot him in the leg. And um, so whatever happened, I know who did it and all that, you know, all that came out later, but whatever happened when I came to work the next day, the dread thought I had something to do with it. You know what I'm saying? And then I'm like, and, and you know, later in retrospect, I'm like, why would I come back to work the next day if I had something to do with it, right? <laughs> but like I told you, he'd be, he be geeked up. He'd be, he be skeeved. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I had came into work, and I remember, man, as soon as I came in, he put the gun in my head. He was upset, blah, 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 screaming. And then this other guy came in, you know, the cop, and I rolled out and ran. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, that was the end of that, right? So, from there... You know, all my drinking is just hanging out with the fellas. You know, everybody putting money together to get, you know, to get bottles. And I just, I just drunk, 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 drunk so much where I guess somewhere along the lines, I crossed the invisible line and I was unable to control the liquor. Then, you know, like, like I said, you know, I, I would just do things like, We'll start drinking, and the guys I would drink with would be like, he's going to make a movie. Like, they expect me to do something crazy. And it, this is what it is. And then, you know, the more I drink, the more, you know, I kept having situations like that. And, um, you know, by then, you know, we in this, we, it's just my crew or whatever, but, you know, it's, we playing with guns. You know, some people got shot. Um, a friend of mine's got shot on his, um, on his stairs and his mom's came out, you know, he was trying to run in the house, you know, it's just stuff like that. And, um, you know, my mother and my aunt, you know, it just, it's it just like, I just kept getting into trouble. I kept getting in trouble, but this, this is, you know, I'm smoking and drinking and, you know, with the wrong crowd, trying to be tough guys, thinking we gangster, you know, all of that. So, but, um, long fast forward, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just making a fool of myself. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to work drunk. I remember like I had the coolest supervisor. I, I came to work drunk. Like I would go to parties and stuff, then go to work. Like, you know what I'm saying? When the sun come up and it's time to go to work, I would go to work after you just been drinking all night. Like, I, I don't know. I would, I would do that. And the, the, the job that I had at the hospital at this time, this is later on. This is after high school. This is when I'm in college. The job that I had, like my drink and progress, you know, she was, you had to, you had to be in school to have that job. And, you know, like she, she looked out for me, you know, she took me to her house. She was the supervisor. She was disappointed. You know, she got with my mother, this, that, and the third. But, you know, like I said, things were just getting worse and worse. So my, my aunt and my mother decided to move to Georgia. So I come down to Georgia. And, um, you know, it's not long behold, you know what I'm saying? Well, I'm back in the same pit. But the only thing that's different now is when I come to Georgia, I buy a car. <laughs> See, in New York, I didn't need a car. You know, I would act a fool on the train, get drunk, you know, get back and forth the way I needed to. But I get to Georgia, I buy a car, and um, I get pulled over, and I get a DUI, and the cops say, you going to jail. And see, in my mind in New York, like, and this is the truth, like back then, the only time you was actually going to jail is if you had crack in your pocket or a gun. 
You know what I'm saying? Like anything else, they they might just rough you up, take your weed, throw it away. You know what I'm saying? Put the handcuffs on you, ride you around the town with the tight handcuffs. You know, just stuff like that. But I got the judge. I don't know. <laughs> I had to go to jail. I'm like, going to jail? Like, this is like a culture shock. I'm like, what you, the jail for what? Drinking? But I was, you know, I was drunk, man. Flying on 75. Yeah, racing somebody. Racing somebody. We was going to um, Virginia Avenue. Yeah, to drink some more. Was leaving one spot and we was racing. Yeah, but so I went to jail, right? Okay. Then boom. So that was, I want to say August. I got that ticket or whatever, you know. Then you start doing the rigmarole, the DUI, whatever you have to do, right? And so in November of that same year, I got another DUI. Because, see, I used to work at night um, at FedEx Freight, right? And then, you know, right across from FedEx Freight is um, Club Blaze, Blazing Saddles. So I used to be in the strip club, get into it, and then go to work because I used to work the night shift. <laughs> so I would go in there, hang out, and then go to work. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. that that You know, I had to drink every day. I was drinking every day. I was drinking every day. So this time... We had got off early because it was like um, Thanksgiving or something. Then I got a failure to maintain lane. You know what I'm saying? The same thing. And then that's when I had two different probations in two different counties. One in Henry County, one in Clayton County. And I'm thinking, being that they connected, they don't know I'm getting away with something, right? So I'm like, as long as they don't find out, you know what I'm saying? And I'm thinking I'm doing something. I'm thinking I'm smart. And um, lo and behold, you know, working two jobs, paying off probation, you know what I'm saying, coming up with crazy ideas because I've had, after the, the, the DUI, I had, um, you know, the, the, the work permit license. And then so what I would do is, I would, um, after the first one, what I would do is I, um, I got AAA. I got AAA because I should still go to the, you know, strip clubs and stuff. And I would say, like, you know, when I get drunk, all I would do is unplug the battery and have AAA take me in the car home so I won't have to drive home. You know what I'm saying? I mean, seriously, this, that's when I first got my AAA. Just unplug the battery, and they're going to take me in the car home, you know? So I did that for a while. But, of course, y'all know you only get four trips. So after the fourth one, I was back to square one, right? All right, so fast forward. Then I got the second DUI. Um, then they, they took my license. So I was riding around. I think they took my license for two years. I was riding around dirty for um, two years. You know what I'm saying? I was getting pulled over. And I, I would say I got pulled over twice. And both times the cops let me go because they, they could see I was going to work. But I was driving with no license because, you know, when they look it up, they could see why. You know what I mean? So I wouldn't say all cops are bad. You know, not all of them. You know, some of them, you know, looked out. And then, um, you know, after that, I had to get the breathalyzer on the car because I, 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 I'm not driving drunk no more, right? But I'm still getting, like, disorderly conduct, public drunk, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, trespassing. I'm getting those kind of charges, but I'm not drunk. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm not driving, right? I'm like, I'm not driving. But I'm still getting arrested and for being overly drunk, you know what I'm saying? So, all right, so fast forward. Um, then I'm, you know, I'm thinking I'm getting away with it. Then I'm like, ah, I, I'm good. I got my license back. Like I said, I had the breathalyzer on the car. I think we had that on for a year or something. You know, you had to pay them to put it on, pay them to monitor it, pay them to take it off. You know what I'm saying? So all of that. But, you know, I'm thinking I'm controlling my drinking with the driving. Controlling my drinking with the driving, right? Until DUI number three comes. So when the third one come, you know what I'm saying? And that, and look, I skipped over a part. So when I tell you about those public drunks and the trespassing, the judge had me doing weekends. Like, I had to turn myself in every weekend. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, for, for like, going, they let you go to work so you could pay probation. But when the weekend come, you got to go to jail and, you know, dress out and you be in jail on weekends. So I, I did that. I had, I had. I, I did that for the longest, for the longest. I mean, my moms used to have to drop me off. So I did that for the longest. So the, the miracle happened, the third DUI. 
and um, you know, talking to the dudes in jail, you know, you know, you don't go to court yet. You know, you got the ticket and stuff, but you don't go to court. So they be like, Oh, you got three. You you about to you about you gotta do a mandatory year. You know what I'm saying? So you got three, you go you're habitual. So you got a mandatory year to do. So I'm like, damn, man, all the stuff I done did, I'm gonna go to jail for a year for drinking. You know what I'm saying? I feel like, oh, the biggest loser ever. You know what I'm saying? Like you gonna go sit down for a year for drinking. So they, you know, got these smart ideas, like go to AA. Now with the first DUI, I went to AA, right? I went to Alcoholics Anonymous at the Clayton house. I remember I walked in, walked past everybody. It was like smoky in there and all that. I just walked in and walked right back out <laughs> and never went back, right? Never went back. Then the second DUI, you know, it was the same thing. But like I told you, I thought I was slick getting away with something because it was two different counties. It was two different probation officers and everything. So telling me to go to AA again. So this time... What I did, I went to AA, and then I figured out, like, get the paper signed. You don't have to worry about them signing the paper because it's an anonymous program. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm so smart. I'm like, who, who, who are they going to call? It's anonymous. Are they lying to themselves? The group is anonymous. So then I start going around. Like I tell y'all, I was still going to work and stuff, but having other people sign. Like, I would have people at work sign. I would have people at Walmart sign. I would, like, sign with your right hand, sign with your left hand. We don't care what name you put. Piss anybody's name. And, you know, I was I was getting away with it, you know, just paying the probation or whatever. And then the third DUI, I remember I had caught that. You know, we was just talking about that. Um, It was Cinco de Mayo. It was Cinco de Mayo, 08. And I got um, arrested, whatever, the whole thing again. So that time I started going to AA for real. Like, And, like, before that, like, a part I left out is um, I had, like, a hit and run. I crashed somebody. Like, I, yo, I don't want to go to a drunk log, but, yo, your boy was drunk all the time. You know, when they when they called me mal liquor, that it, I really lived up to the name. And I think that, too, like, because, you know, they gave me that name, and I think I would drink more just to live up to the name because that's what people expected, right? That's what I think now. Like, I just, you know, just to show my ass. But um, so I went to AA this time. So I'm starting to go to AA, you know, not really paying attention, sitting in the back, trying to get the paper signed before I actually go see the judge. So when I see the judge, I got a sheet full, right? Like, I'm like, yeah, Your Honor, I'm, I'm done, you know, trying not to go to jail for a year. So I'm going to AA, and um, this is where I, um, I met the Stockbridge group. And then at first, even with the Stockbridge group, you know, it was the same old thing. I was sitting in the back, you know what I'm saying, trying to get my paper signed. But the beauty of it, right, when I was going, it was a lot of young ladies in there. Like, I was like, yo, like I got up in there, yo, I was like, yo, I'm trying to take something home. Like, I like I would go to AA because, you know, it was it was it was ladies in there. So me, I'm trying to talk up something to come with me to Taco Max so we could drink after the meeting. You know what I'm saying? That, 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 I'm telling you, my plan, like my plan was like, I, you know, Taco Max was on this side of 138. The Ramada was right there. And I was like, it worked. Like, you just keep using the same plan. You know me, I'm the type of that work with averages. I'm like, you shoot your shot ten times, two gonna go. Two out of ten gonna go. So, um, that's what I was doing, right? But all with that, but as I'm sitting in the meeting, you know, and this is this is some time in the meeting, and then this is why I love my original home group so much, because they would stay in the literature, and you know me, like I'm saying, it, like this is before we're like, you know, we had cell phones to distract you all the time. This is when the state was the flip. You really couldn't do too much, right? So they be reading from the book and stuff, and they would say shit that I'm going through. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, how the fuck you, the book? I'm like, how the book you wrote a book about me? Like, you know what I'm saying? Then it start getting interesting. Because, you know, I think I'm smart. I think I'm smart, right? So I'm like, oh, then now I'm picking up the book, and I'm reading the book. And then, you know, I got, you know, then I'm like, I'm paying attention more. And, um, you know, because we do the 12 and 12. And it, it was just amazing to me that, you know, all this stuff was in the book about alcohol. Like, and then the people would talk about their alcoholism. And I'm like, 
these are people that really know about alcohol. Like, because if I go anywhere else and talk about alcohol, people be like, your favorite, like, oh, you can stop. You could, uh, I could, no. You know what I'm saying? Like, I always say, like, you know, you had the cool on, and she used to always ask me, like, why? Because I would always get locked up. I'm always in jail calling to get bailed out, right? So she used to be like, why you do that? Because, you know, you're a lot of your mother. You're a lot to your mother, but you're going to keep it real with your cool aunt, right? And she used to be like, why do you drink like this? Why can't you? And I never had an answer. And I, my answer was always, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But when I came to AA, you know, in time, I understood why, you know, like the allergy, you know, this is what it really meant to be an alcoholic. So... The way this happened, right? Like I tell you, like I'm in, I'm in AA, and um, I got a girlfriend in AA, and I got another girl I like in AA. So I would tell my girlfriend in AA to go upstairs to the beginner meeting because they had a beginners meeting upstairs, and I'ma stay downstairs in the regular meeting, still trying to get the other girl, right? Crazy, crazy, crazy. So, but. The greatest thing happened. So, all right, around this time, two of the greatest things happened. So, there's a lady at my home group. She had asked me out the blue to help her set up. You know what I'm saying? They didn't know me from a G because, you know, she was like, she can't carry the boxes. So, I guess she seen me. was like, oh, you big for nothing. Like, come grab these boxes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You just big. Grab these boxes. We're going to set the meeting up. And then when she asked me, it's like, you know, one of them situations where you can't say no. And I'm like, and I was coming to get the paper signed anyway, so I was like, all right. So, you know, I would come, she would open the doors, and I would carry the stuff out, and we would set up the meeting, blah, blah, blah. Then, not too long after that, I'm in the parking lot after the meeting, right? Like I told you, I'm trying to get to Taco Mac. I'm trying to holler at Shorty. We talking, and then, not, he wasn't my sponsor then, but this is my first sponsor. This dude come up to, the, like, after the meeting, was like, yo, we're going to have a group conscience. You, you want to come and da, da, da. And he's talking to me like AA terms, right? But in my mind, I'm like, this cock blocking motherfucker don't get a, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? That's how I'm on it. Like, yo, this dude really trying to stop. Like, and I'm thinking I'm getting somewhere. But lo and behold, you know, after some time, that's the dude I had asked to be my sponsor. Cause um, you know, at the time he was the GSR. See, look, all this stuff I never knew nothing about. And then afterwards, I become the GSR. You know what I'm saying? Like, but at the time. I didn't know anything about that. And so when I asked him to be my sponsor, you know, he he was a great sponsor. He was the sponsor I needed. Because you know how you'd be like, if somebody in my family would have tried to get me to stop drinking, I'm not going to listen to them because I'm thinking they're they full of BS. You know what I'm saying? So it was it had to be somebody that didn't have, that wasn't getting nothing out of it. Like it had to work that way. The way AA works for all of us, it had to be that way. It had to be you doing it for me without thinking you're going to get anything back, right? Because, you know, I always say, like, you know, at the time, I was a young black dude from New York, and he was an old white guy from the South. And you know what I'm saying? So, like, we had nothing in common but drinking. And, um, you know, he took me. He took me. He was cool. You know what I'm saying? He was older than me. You know, he was married. And, um, you know, he was just doing a deal. And then, you know... Later, I realized, you know, we all do this one day at a time. But, you know, it was real big to me that he was taking out time just to work with me and didn't even know me. Right. So, you know, I'm doing the AA now. You know, um, the first time I was introduced to the steps was another program was um, Celebrate Recovery. Right. So when I really started paying attention to AA, I was like, these are the same things from Celebrate Recovery. I'm thinking. You know, AA took it from them, not knowing that they took it from AA, right? I'm like, yeah, hey, y'all biting, you know, but it, that, it was the other way around. And, um, but lo and behold, um, I started getting sober. And I always say this because it's the truth. So, um, I used to always pick up white chips, you know what I'm saying? Because I called it being honest. You know, we, we focus on honesty. Like, long as I'm being honest, like, I would leave and go drink and I come back to the next meet and get a white chip. And as um, long as I'm being honest, I kept getting white chips, right? So one time, I heard um, a member's story that's in the big book. He spoke at my home group at the lady that I tell you that asked me to help her at her um, birthday. 
and the stuff he was talking about, I could remember being on the news when I was little. You see what I'm saying? Like, I could remember that stuff being on the news, paying attention. Because, you know, you're a little kid, you want to be a pilot, and it was real big. I mean, it was big. And when he started talking that, it was like, it was like, it was like a quantum leap. He's like, oh, that's the dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the dude from the news. And then that time, I picked up another white chick. I was like, I'm doing it this time. You know, just off the strength of his story, because I was like, he's happy now. You know what I'm saying? And um, lo and behold, I picked up that white chip, and then uh, my birthday came around, right? So I didn't know what to do for my birthday but drink. So guess what I did? I got, you know what I'm saying, I got drunk, because all I knew what to do was drink. But So that's when my, my birthday had fell on a Sunday that year. And then that Monday, like my normal routine, I pick up another white chip. But the, it was three older ladies at my home group. You know what I'm saying? Like, they got up and was like, they were so moved that I got this white chip, right? Like, this white chip was special. And it was like, they, they had like tears in their eyes and hugging me. And they were so happy that I picked up another white, because I guess they seen I had more time. Like, it was my time, but picking up white chips had grew. I had like, like a month or something in between instead of just, you know what I'm saying? So... And then I realized to myself that day, I was like, these people care more about me than I care about myself. And that's the honest truth. And that was in my home group. And um, so after that white chip, you know, I started doing the, you know, just staying with my sponsor and everything and um, getting some time. Then I was in a bad car accident. I was in a car accident. I was sober. But it was bad where I had to stay in the hospital for 13 days, right? And this is the funniest thing ever, right? So I'm in the hospital laid up, you know, you heard of or whatever. And so people would come visit me from AA, right? And then one of the nurses was like, who the hell is this guy? He got all these white people visiting him. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they would just come and visit me, visit me. And the nurse is like, yo, who is that? Like, who is that? It's like, it's like they, they keep coming. I'm talking about, yo. And, um, yeah, that, that was like one of the things, man. And, um, so, but, uh, you know, since then, that was like, that was, that was, like I said, that was around six months. That was around, that was before six months. Cause I remember I met my wife. You see, I keep telling you I chase the girls, right? So I met my wife too, but I met my wife while my sponsor had me on task. Like it was doing nineties and nineties. So my sponsor had it where I could go to church or I had to be in the meeting, you know what I'm saying? But you could count church as, you know what I'm saying, as going. And, um, you know, I would go to Wednesday Bible study because they was giving food, plates of food. So, you know, I'm going to get the plate. I'm going to Bible study. And then, you know, lo and behold, I met my wife. She'll tell you a different story, but she was checking for the kid. You know what I'm saying? She might tell you something else, though. But um, so I met her and... um. You know, and um, I guess, you know, my life was changing, right? My life was changing because I wasn't drinking. So everything was brand new. And my relationship with her was brand new. And um, I was just trying something new. And um, so we've been married now. This would be our 11th year. This would be our 11th year marriage in September because I just got 14. Yeah. But um. That was another good thing, and um, you know, I and I, I have to say, I always been in service. Like I said, my my sponsor was the GSR, and um, for some reason, he left the group. I don't know what happened. You know, you know, AA got politics in it too, right? You find out AA got politics, so something happened, and you know, he stopped coming to the meeting. And then my grand sponsor, his sponsor, would be like, "Yo, have you seen him?" And I'd be like, nah, you know, I would see my grand sponsor more than my sponsor. And I was spending more time with my grand sponsor than I was with my sponsor. But it all worked out. You see what I'm saying? Because I was already plugged in. And then, um, lo and behold, I had to switch sponsors. Then my, my second sponsor passed away. Then I had got a third sponsor. My third sponsor would encourage me to do things that a married man shouldn't do. He wouldn't encourage me, but he'd make it look like it's, it's all right to do, right? So, you know what I'm saying? You know, he was he was good on the AA tip, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, some things would be like you can't you can't live two lives. You can't you can't live a double life. So 
Then I, you know, it got me another sponsor. And then I just say great sponsorship got me here because through all of it, I've learned that in the beginning, I just got the wrong information. You know what I'm saying? Like you grow up as a little kid watching your older cousins. You want to be a player. You want to have all the girls and it. You know what I'm saying? Get the money. You know what I'm saying? It's uh, like, and then to, like today, we all realize that none of that means nothing without, you know, a connection to God. And and I always say this, like in AA, before AA, I knew God, right? Because I grew up in a Baptist household. I went to Catholic school. My stepfather was a Muslim. You know what I'm saying? So it was like I was getting fed. You know what I'm saying? All different types of things about God, but, and I, and I would pray, and it even like, it, even in my bad times, like my dark times, like before, like, like let's just say, like, if I'm about to rob something, right? I would pray beforehand to keep me safe. Like, how you pray? You know, I mean, this is the truth. Like, you would pray to keep you safe, but you out here trying to hit somebody in the head and take something off of them. You know what I'm saying? It just... But that's that's just my story, and it's the truth. And um, you know, I just came into AA, and um, and I say I say this too because when I first like really got it, and I was really trying to get sober, it was a lot of people in AA with me, and y'all know I love everybody, so I'm a friendly guy. Like I got you know my, my my whole network of friends is in AA, and um, you know, a lot of them, you know, not allowed to get a white chip no more because they're not here. But then we had some that was able to keep doing research, coming in and out, coming in and out. And the only reason why I never had that problem is because I always had a job. Like when they seen I was serious this time, you know what I'm saying? My group, the Stockbridge group, like they moved me up front. Like I was in the back, like I'll be in the back of the meeting, you know, where I have a sponsor, right? And I'm writing stuff down. So he the GSR, so we in group conscience. And then I remember the secretary, she was leaving, because you know she'd been the secretary for like probably six, seven years, and she was like trying to give it up, right? She's like, I can't do this no more. Then she was like, get him. He always writing down stuff anyway. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I used to be in the back, you know, writing down raps. Like, you know, the slick stuff we say in AA? I, my mind, I was going to compile everything into a song and get, you know, and blow up, right? That's how I was. Like, that's where my mom was at. And I would, you know, jot the stuff and that, you know, I'd be pinning it together while they doing their thing. And then they made me the secretary. They made me the secretary. And then that's all they had to do. I was like, this group going to fall apart as unorganized as I am. <laughs> And then, you know, like I tell you, one of them ladies, he's like, baby, don't worry about it. As bad as you are, this group was here before you was here, this will be here after you. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, you know, the greatest things, man. And um, those three ladies, man, helped me through a lot of stuff. Because even like, even like, so, you know, I'm a big dude, right? And I'm telling you, when I tell you, these ladies are older. So I would say something to me and think I'm sharing, right? Sharing, oh, then I go get some coffee or something. Here come this maid, right? She had to cut me off. Boom. Being there, like, locked up in there. She got me in the coffee room. Like, no. You, you know, just getting on my case. Like, straight checking me, right? Then I come out like this. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, all, it's over. But, you know, and I mean stuff like that. And then just being sober, you know, and, um, like, right now, I'm a treasurer of a zone. Well, all I know is to just stay in service and stay sober, right? And when I tell y'all, like, the honest truth, like, my, when we talk about a complete psychic change, that had to happen because the way I think now is not the way I used to think before. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even think like that no more. Like, you know, like, going to somebody's pockets, or, you know, some this. This man, that's why I be like, when I look outside today, I be like, wow, we in the worst time. Because I remember with me, how I used to be. So I can imagine, you know, a 16 year old right now with a gun in his hand. Because you know what I'm saying? Like, they'd be burning a hole in your pocket. Like, you just want to pop something. And I know that. But, um, yeah, I saved me. AA saved me. You know what I'm saying? AA saved me. Um, I stopped drinking. My life started, you know, I've been at the same job now since 2000. Look, I got sober in 2009. I started working this other job in 2010, and I'm still there. 
You know, so you'd be like, what is that? Complacency or contentment? You know what I'm saying? You know, I got to write on that, right? You know what I'm saying? You got you to do a full, full column inventory on that guy. But it's much better than, you know, losing a job, losing, you know what I'm saying? Back and forth. I mean, I got some stability, man. And, you know, I get to do things like this weekend we was down in Dublin taking care of AA business because, you know, right now, 14 years later, I'm the GSO of my home group. You know what I'm saying? Like, still. You know? And um, and I always say that that's the only thing that kept me sober. Because just like everybody else that got sober with me in the beginning, I think I would have strayed out too if I didn't have something to do. You know what I'm saying? That's why I'd be like, you know, you hear people say it, it sounds like a cliche, and it should have been the title of my rap song. But the secret is service. Like, you know, I mean... You, you put yourself, you, you get yourself out of it. You get yourself out of it. And, you know, you start caring about other people, you could, you get sober. And, um, you know, I, I do the deal. I pray, I meditate. And um, I just keep coming back. Thank you for letting me share. Right. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.